and I was following this, tracking this deer, and I got up pretty high, and a little winded, you know, and I sat down on a log, <clears throat> and I was looking down into the valley there, and, and the tracks had gone up behind me, and I got out a sandwich and started to eat the sandwich, and I, I heard this weird noise behind me. to another episode of Northwoods Whitetails Podcast. This is part two to the Dell Green episode. If you guys missed part one, go back to last week's episode and get caught up and then listen to this one. Thank you so much for listening and uh, I hope you enjoy it. And so I started going out and in, in a little depression out in there, he was laying there. And I finished him <laughs> off and got him the it's pretty happy, obviously, and so I'm all alone. So I got a long ways to go, but it's downhill. You know, it's a little bit of this, but mostly all downhill. So I dragged and dragged. You know, if you had to do that for a living, you would have left it. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I finally get down to the logging road, and I pull the deer down into the edge of it, but you know, not quite to the road. It's not the road that I drove in on. So I got to go back through Budweiser Brook. A little too early for that, but <laughs> let's get along towards afternoon by the time I got the deer out. So <clears throat> they're logging up this other road. So I get to my truck, drive about seven miles down across this bridge, come up here, and I can hear they're logging. Well, I drive in and they're not logging, it's late. You know, it's uh, 4.30, 4, 4.30. And it's a mechanic working on a feller buncher, you know, and running it and so he's French and he doesn't speak any English and I don't speak any French. So, you know, I get out of the truck, he was polite, he stopped doing it and I walk up to him and I said, I shoot big buck. He goes, he goes, big buck, big buck. I said, yeah. I said, you don't, no lock gate, you know, gate? And he goes, no lock. I said, okay. You, no lock, no, no lock. I said, thank you. So now I drive out this road, and I can't get the freaking deer in my truck. So I have a snatch block, and I went up in, into the woods <laughs> 20 feet, and, and I put a rope around and, I got, and then I put a bigger rope on that and I dragged the deer back up the bank with my truck. So then I tie it off and I back my ass end down in the ditch and now I got the buck loaded. I get my snatch block, coal up my rope. I'm pretty happy, you know, I pull out of there. I drive down to the road and the gate's locked. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, Guess he didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> my, my my French wasn't very good. <laughs> he he wasn't that nice of a guy then, <laughs> as you thought. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. funny. I tell, and I didn't have any help there. So, I'll tell you one thing: when you see those little things that the locks are up inside, you're not gonna you're not going out. Mm. The best thing was that I swear it was like three in the morning, the loggers came in. <laughs> oh, so you stayed in a truck right there. I didn't have any choice, you know. Yeah. Miles yeah. and miles away. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't upset. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 I tried to figure out ways I could get around that, and I even mm. thought of going up. And I have a key to every skitter I've ever made in my truck. Mm -hmm. And... I thought of doing that, but I couldn't see. It, the, the gate was in a perfect place, and it would have been difficult. There were trees, and it just, yeah. uh, that wasn't going to work, so yeah. I ruled that out. And you obviously had food 
Worst case, you had food in the back of the truck. You know, I didn't have hardly anything but an extra chocolate bar or something. I went into a closet and weighed it the next morning, and I brought it back, and I took it down to the lake there. I was staying in a log cabin up in... Uh, Parmachini. Huh? Parmachini. Parmachini Lake. Mm-hmm. And uh, I washed it all out good, and I pulled it with my truck back up to the game pole, and I got it hung up. I just finished. It was my first year of hunting there. Don't know anybody. There was seven camps on that whole lake, as big as Seymour, you know. It's it's locked, you know. I got to know everybody there. You got to know about the, the ribbon, the survey ribbon. Bring that up. So I'm just finishing tying the thing off, getting it, you know, up there. And down in comes a vehicle. And there was uh, two older men in it, and they got out and come down. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, you heard about that. I said, Where'd you hear that? He said, Well, we went to Aquasic. Uh, he said, You know, and we all do. We all want to see what was. Yeah. Well, so you're the one that got it. Yeah. yeah. Boy, that's a beauty. He said, Where's Coon? And I said, Oh, they're not in. There's nobody here. He said, you get that out alone? I said, yeah, I did. Uh, he said, well, I'm so-and-so, and this is so-and-so. I'm Dale Green. He said, well, let me some- tell you something, lad. I thought he was maybe a little upset, a new guy in the chained-off area, you know, gated off. He said, we're kind of a nice little community, tight-knit little community here. He said, don't you ever drag anything again. He said, we may be old, but we can still drag, or we'll get somebody that can. So from now on, you you come get us when you need help. Promise? Friends, fellow hunters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? And here I was nervous that they were going (laughs) to, what were they going to do? Yep. Yep. Uh, Yep. What did I ask you to read? The ribbon. Okay, this is Blue ribbon? Yeah. Yeah, Survey ribbon. Yeah. A friend of mine, Denny McGuire from New Hampshire, great guy, asked me if I wanted to go to that camp, um, not that camp, but another camp at the end of the lake. It belonged to old Jim Emerson, who owned Emerson Store in... Groveton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I could only go to the other camp for a week, so I can go to that one for three more (laughs) if I want. Boy, I jumped all over that, so... I go to the camp with him. There's about eight people there, two or three old guys. One, Jim had Parkinson's disease. I don't know anybody, but after a while, you know somebody. And so I had a nice evening, and we all go to bed, and we get up, and most of us went off hunting. Then he said he was going someplace, and I told him I was going this other place. And if we need, we don't show up, we can look for each other, so... He goes where he's going to go, and I went across the river on the big bridge, and 100 yards up the road, there's a big track. Nowhere's near where I was going to go, and it's headed uphill. So I got out and looked at it. I said, holy shit. So I, I parked my truck. I take after the deer, and the, the, the deer squeezed me into the river. I knew it was going to happen, and when I got up in where there was no recourse, the deer went across, so took my pants and underwear and boots and stuff off, got across the river, got on the other side. I got this down to a pat. I take my flannel shirt off, wipe myself off all of that. <laughs> I get dressed, and I I go up onto the road, and I'm going to walk down the road to the bridge. No, I'm going to follow the deer. That's right. So I get up there, and Denny's truck's parked right there. And I thought of a bitch. So I go up a little ways, he's on the deer. Well, okay. So I go back down, I had a whole roll of the fluorescent <laughs> pink survey ribbon. <clears throat> so I, I tied 250 feet of it all over his pickup, from the trailer hitch to the bumpers to the door <laughs> handles to the windshield wipers, 250 feet, fluorescent pink. <laughs> so I leave, and so I go hunting. You're not gonna believe this. I go up on the peaks, and I shoot an eight-point buck. 
right at dark walking off. So I got it out, leave it there, and I'm late, real late. And I get back to camp, and everybody's back there. And so I walk in, and Denny's about your height. That I walk in, and he had told me, when you come back hunting, old Jim wants a story. And don't just tell him you didn't see anything today. He wants to know where you went. He can't hunt. He sh what we share with him is his day. So you're good at that. So tell him that you saw four squirrels and whatever. Tell him something. I said, okay. So I came in. Denny didn't see me at first. And I saw Jim. And so I started to go towards him. And I don't know these guys. Denny jumps up and comes over and he gets right in my face like you would to me but right here <laughs> and you little son of a bitch I said what you know what I said of course they all know <laughs> so what you know what you did I said I don't know what you think talking about putting that freaking ribbon all over my truck it took me an hour to take it all off <laughs> I said you got a ribbon all over your truck yeah you ought to know you put it there I said Denny this morning when we left, we told each other where we were going in case we got hurt or lost or something. We could find each other. And I said, I didn't go. I don't even. Did you go where you said you were going? Yeah. I said, well, I went to Thrasher Peaks. He goes over to this kid. The first time he's been to camp, too, with a friend, older friend, started in on him. He's denying it. <laughs> there, I get rid of him. <laughs> so... <laughs> That would be the end of this? No. Those stick-on bullet holes, <laughs> you, you need to have some. <laughs> Second to your rifle, don't forget the bullet holes. <laughs> so the next day, we got to go get my deer, right? Mm -hmm. So we get the deer, and we come back to camp and stuff, and we hang it up, and I don't know, it's noon or something, that's out. I'm going bird hunting. So I I took off to go bird hunting. And and I I'm scouting. <laughs> so I come back and I see Charlie Hatfield's his name. There's a hunting family over in New Hampshire. The kids truck that Charlie's with is parked. And so it's dark. So I go by it, and they're not out of the woods yet, and I know they're down by the lake, and if they're coming, they're going to have their little flashlights, you know, something on. So I go back in the dark, and I rub off a little spot in the back quarter panel, and I put one of them bullet holes on. So then I walk back, and I go to camp. So about 20 minutes after I'm at camp, in comes Charlie. The kid's not in yet. So old Jim says, well, what'd you see today, Charlie? Charlie says, well, I didn't see too much till we got back to the truck. What, what do you mean? He says, somebody shot, put a bullet right through Danny's pickup, right through the back end. Really, everybody jumps up. Of course, I jumped up, you know. <laughs> All but old Jim, we run down, down to the truck, and there's this big old yellow yard light, old, old antique thing. It's not very bright. There's a big generator running there. So we all looked at it, you know. We're all, son of a bitch. Right off, they're blaming this camp across the lake. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it had to be them. And then they're, they're mad. They're like, it, it wouldn't be anybody else here. Them sons of bitches, they've been, this is it. You know, so they're really mad. So they go back inside, and they're debating how to handle this, you know. So all of a sudden, <laughs> in comes the kid. And somebody said, then we're, we're, we think we know what's going on here, and we'll get your truck repaired, and we know who's paying for it. He goes, well, there's not a lot of repair. Why is that? Well, I got to wondering where that bullet came out, so I went around the other side, and there's no bullet hole, and there's no bullet hole in my tailgate. There's no bullet hole. And I went back and looked at that, and there's just a fake bullet hole. <laughs> Denny McGuire, he gets right up again. He comes over to me. You little son of a bitch. We never had any problems in this camp ever <laughs> for 40 years <laughs> until you came here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Should be the end of the story. I stayed a few more days than the coon, 
and the other guys came to the other camp, and so <coughs> I'm going to move down there. And so I went and did something, maybe with my Jeep. doesn't matter. I, I come back, and I had a big cooler and a small cooler on the porch. Well, it was in a porch, you know. And they were out on – I had put them out on the deck in the morning. And so I went to put them in the back of my truck. So – I went to lift them, and I can't lift them, and I thought, oh, they screwed them to the deck, you know. <laughs> so I opened the the cover, and it, full of rocks about that big. I mean, it weighed 100 something pounds. I opened the little one. There's no f pots and no food or anything. So I walk in the shed, and all my food was there. So the old man and the old man's friend were inside. And at one time when I opened the cover I glanced up and they were in the in the window but they're just like little kids you know <laughs> Ducking. so I took care of my stuff put it in my truck and uh, then I went in to thank them for letting me stay there and everything and yeah and we shook hands and I got over by the door I said hey you wouldn't know how the hell all those rocks could have ever got in those coolers and old Bob Kidder said yeah I, I know so now I'm finding out. I said, so who was it? Uh, not, well, not a person. Those are rock birds. So we have some big rock birds around here, and they do that all the time. <laughs> I said, really? But where do those rock birds come from? He goes, well. Rocks. <laughs> they've been known to come, a lot of them come from Whitefield, New Hampshire. <laughs> so then I knew it was Charlie Hatfield. <laughs> okay, so I said goodbye and laughed. I got in my truck, drove down in the driveway, started to go, and I hear something in my truck. And it sounded like a branch on your universal joint, you know. <laughs> I got out, and I just looked up under the truck. And, you know, I laid down. I can't see anything, so. I get in the truck and I backed up kind of careful. I don't hear it. And I pull ahead again. Huh. So I start to go again. I can hear it again. Son of a bitch. So I get out and I walk around the back of the truck and there's a rope there with about 30 beer cans tied to it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else was at that camp. And when I was in doing my thing, he did that. I never have found out who, who it was. <laughs> Maybe this will bring it forward. Uh oh. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. good. That is good. That's well, pretty good. Let me see if I got another one. <laughs> okay. Hey, we're, we're getting through these. There. Huh. How, how about the um, working with the state to start muzzle loading season? You had a big part of that for the state of Vermont, right? Yeah. I. Um, yeah, we had been going, you know, that Vermont Fish and Wildlife Conservation Group that we have formed in the Northeast Kingdom, and a lot of people in Long Pond belong to it. We, we built a fish hatchery in Morgan. That was my baby, and I went to the state and got got uh, people involved, and uh, we rebuilt that hatchery, and we uh, we put fingerlings out. The state gives them to us, but we rebuilt the whole hatchery, and it belongs to our, our club. Uh, and in the spring, we put in the papers and stuff, and we'd, we'd like to have kids involved in it. So, well, you've done that? Yeah, Have yeah, you? yeah. My old man went and got something from you guys and uh, brought my boy, who's three oh, years old. Good. Yep, yep. They released him in our beaver pond. So that's always been uh, something I, I'm a little proud of. Yeah. Especially when some of my friends said you'll never pull that off. Mm -hmm. So then we, as a group, not as a group, but say three or four of us, Willard Taft. Uh, anyway, we went to Montpelier several years. You know, Willard and I were hunting in New Hampshire and for years and tried to get the state to start a muzzle load of season and they would have none of it. And so next year we went again, the next year we went again and everybody gave up. So 
the next year, I got a hold of Brian Smith's father, is Kerm Smith. He was the sergeant at arms in the state house. So I'm leaving some things out, but I, I made a deal with him that I wanted to come in. Would he get me a meeting with, with the Fish and Wildlife Board members? So he, he said he would, and, and he did. And so I went down, and I brought two muzzleloaders, but in cases. And he said, come up to the state house, the side door at 10 o'clock. So at 9.30, I'm at the door, but it's pretty obvious I got guns. So I stood him up there and stayed and stayed and stood there. for. It was like a half an hour late. I was early to begin with. And so finally, some lots of people seemed to be coming out, but everybody would look at the guns and look at me and pick up speed. Finally, somebody going in, after a couple of times I said, excuse me, and they just look and keep going. Finally, somebody stopped, and I told him what I just told you, and that mm. could he try to find Kerm Smith for me. So five minutes later, Kerm came, and he'd forgotten about it. But he hadn't forgotten the meeting. Mm -hmm. He'd lined that up. So he took the guns, and I followed him up to this meeting, and uh, there was, I don't know, seven people there. And there were two or three women on the meeting uh, on the board and so they knew I was coming and what really happened is somebody had told one of them and they had a fear of these muzzle loaders blowing up if you shot and then poured powder down the breach too soon they would blow up and injure or kill people well that probably happened during the Civil War, you know, but so anyway, I found that out. Um, so I went and put on a big spiel about the whole thing, but I had done some homework and I'd gotten a lot of info from New Hampshire. So, you know, similar states and the income they were deriving from their muzzleloader season alone was a big help to their department. And so I had the figures. So, you know, between that and me convincing them nobody was going to die with this, and it's a great sport, and it's kids, mm. everything like that. And I was, you know, the kids' things, like you can downcharge these things so they hardly kick. Kids can use them. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, they and, passed it. And that was in 1989? Something like roughly. that. Roughly, <laughs> yeah. So I was always uh, kind of proud of that. Yeah. But here's something I'm more proud of. When the, the feds and the state were in looking at buying the big lands up here, I'm wondering if I should tell this story. Was this when Champion owned the land? Yes. Or were gonna was going to yes. sell it off? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I was asked to be on the panel. I, th I believe there was uh, tw 12 of us, and I think we met for 10 months, and I think it was once a month. And a number of us that were there were trying to save the lands for what we'd always used it for, you know, snowmobiling, recreation, mm -hmm. hunting, fishing, and everything. And there were, we weren't winning. Mm -hmm. Little by little, we knew we weren't getting anywhere they were gonna close roads and they wouldn't promise to leave anything open. And um, it was very frustrating. So on my way to Montpelier, I'm gonna back up a little bit. My father was the head of the state police up here. Said, you know, we have a camp. We're wondering what's gonna happen. Everybody was on pins and needles about this. The camp ownership was a big item. So my dad was a big but quiet man asked me how I was doing down there, and I told him about what I told you. And he said, you know, son, you got one meeting left. I said, yeah. He said, I, do you remember which way, by order of uh, Robert's rules, when you start taking testimony, did they go from left to right or right to left? Because technically and legally, you have to go opposite the next meeting. 
Well, I knew that, but forgot about it. But I've been uh, chair, president of clubs and stuff, and so I knew that. I said, yeah. He said, you know which way it went last time? Well, you should because you remember where you were sitting. I said, yeah. So he should go the other way. I said, well, yeah. He said, you get your butt down there way before everybody else, and you sit in that chair next to Ron Reagan. Remember the commissioner? Mm -hmm. He was chairing that whole thing. Mm -hmm. I was down there an hour early. Instead of milling out in the yard uh, area, I, I went in and sat down. <laughs> the lady that was kind of overseeing it for the land trust, I, know, I knew her well, but I'll leave that out a bit for now. She was sitting opposite me. So they took final testimony from all of us. It was quite long. And it got to me, and I said, well, he, Ron, I knew Ron. He said, well, Del, you're the last one here. And then I guess these testimonies are over, so you're up. I said, well, some of you are going to like this, and some of you aren't, but we've banded together, and we've raised, uh, we've, uh, what do you call it when you an attorney you um, hired well okay hired but retained an attorney retained. and I said so we get ten thousand dollars pledged for that and so we already got a retainer well Sally okay Sally she stood up and she was mad and I mean she was leaning over the table yelling mad and everybody was looking at me going like this and <laughs> So one of the things she said was, do you have any idea, any idea, Del, of the amount of money it would take to fight this and hold this whole thing up for months at a time? And I said, yeah, we, we do. She says, well, I don't think you do. And I said, you know what you don't know, Sally? These camps aren't owned by a bunch of bums. These camps are people that are from all walks of life. There's doctors and dentists and attorneys, big oil company owners, businessmen from everywhere, and yes, some of the lesser. But I said, I got pledges for over $100,000 or whatever I need. And so that's the way it is. Well, she blew up. And Ron was trying to calm her down, and she was screaming mad, and he called a recess, and we went out. And the, well, they had a, the governor's secretary was there. I'm being very careful here. He was at all the meetings, taking the minutes of the meetings and stuff. And so I knew him well. He actually was in on a camp a mile from ours. So anyway, he came over to me. Well, oh, wait. Sorry. He, we, he tried to start the meeting again, Ron did, and... It failed in one minute, and she was just screaming mad. So he adjourned. I don't know what we're going to do, but I'll get in touch with you people. And so we went out, out in the hall, and this guy came to me and asked if I would go see the governor. And I said, yeah, I'll go anytime. And he said, could you go now? I said, I'll go right now. He said, okay, well... I just got to call and tell him that you are coming. I said, call him. So he did. So we went to Montpelier. We were in Waterbury. And we got over there, and we had to wait a long time in what I took to be his office. A long time. So he, but they have an itinerary, you know. For, so he finally came in, and it was Governor Dean. Mm -hmm. And we stood up, you know, and he glared at me. And he, he walked around and around, and then he, he said, what do you want? Not in those words. He was mad. And I said, well, you know, in all due respect, sir, you should know because he's been taking the minutes of these meetings right along. And he said, well, I don't know what happened there, you know, today. And so, well, he had told him. So, the, the attorney thing wasn't true. 
had made that up. But nobody knows that, hey. o- only me. Mm-hmm. So uh, we did not have a campers association. So I told him what I wanted and everything, you know, and he told that guy to write these things up, and he was, and he said, get it, get it typed up on the legal p- paperwork and call me b- back. So we waited, and, and this lady came in, and we went over things, and I spent quite a while, the, the wording, you know, mm-hmm. an hour. And she was very nice, and she went and typed it up, brought it back. And the funny thing was, this guy that I didn't care a lot for, he was a fellow hunter. Whether he was ethical or not, uh, he was a hunter, so that didn't hurt. Yeah. He didn't want to lose his camp either. So, uh, okay, one thing led to another. It, finally, the, the governor came back, and he looked it over and fast. I knew he didn't read it. And then he signed it, and he said, are you satisfied, you know? And I said, not really. I said, I'd like uh, this. There's three lines there underneath yours, and I'd like at least two witnesses. And I said, and I'd like an, and they need to be somebody that both you and I approve. He threw his coat, his suit coat, I swear to God. He threw it, and he tried to throw it in a chair, and it missed. It went on the floor, and he walked over, and he kicked his coat. He turned around, and he was not happy. I didn't trust him. So I got... The thing was in session, you know. The, I got a, our, our representative and our senator from the Northeast Kingdom. They were there in 15 minutes. So now I had what I wanted, and they signed it. They read it. Mm-hmm. They were for it, too. Sure. He probably knew that, but oh, he was, and he left. So everybody patted me on the back, and out the door I go. Well... I didn't go very far because I knew I got to have a, a camp association real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, who was the guy <laughs> that I called? <laughs> he was a, an attorney, and he was a. Uh, he was a camp now in Madison Square Garden. Remember that name? What do you call it? What did he? A lobbyist in, in Montpelier. So I called him. I knew him. And I told him just what I told you. He said, Oh, we got to do this fast. We need, and he stuttered in his name. It's like a chain letter. We got to do it by phone. We got to have something by tomorrow. And he said, So I'm going to get a hold of various people. You get a hold of various people. We need every camp owner we can get. And um, get all the information to me, and I'll take care of it. Well, I'm not very smart, but I got to thinking, why don't I just go on uh, St. Regis uh, <laughs> uh, uh, champion uh, leasee holders? Well, you know, in minutes, I had every name I List. wanted and uh, phone numbers. So we did the phone number thing with other people who were helping me and stuff in uh, two days. Had it locked up? And yeah. <laughs> that's good. No kidding. Yeah, I never... No, they've done very little of it, but it, if they were to pull a culvert, then you've lost access to that land. So any culvert I wanted to be replaced, it could not be unreplaced. And same with bridges. I know now we have lost a little bit, but very marginal. So yeah. that's my yeah. mm. story. It I'm, is. Yeah. That's why I tell people I'm a professional liar. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, though. It worked. Yeah. It saved, you know? it saved it for a lot of people. You essentially saved, well, in my opinion, what's oh, actually God, the Northeast it, Kingdom, right? To me, well, that it, is the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah, it, it was um, a great feeling. <laughs> and yeah, a lot of people knew. That. And if I hadn't, I don't know what ever made me think of that driving down there. It was just, what can I do? What can I do? Money. Money talks. And then before I got there, I had a plan. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Huh. I thought you might like that one. Yeah, that's pretty good. Hey, hey. 
Hey, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your thought? Like when Champion sold a lot of that land, I mean, it was cut off, right? But when the feds bought it, I mean, did anybody know that it was going to go the way that it is now? I mean, that land is pretty well, I don't want to say useless, but it is to it wildlife. Is. It really is. And and yeah. there's nothing it seems like anybody can do about it. Um, I, you know, we never had coyotes. And they hurt our herd so bad. Uh, we never had a problem till the coyotes came. And then deeper into the woods there. And you guys get around a lot. I don't know if you have, but I've seen coyote kills fresh. Fresh. Not a lot of them, but... When we're walking out of the woods in the dark, which we all do, right then, that transition, they pick up and, and then another and another, and then they find each other, and they they gang up on it. And I've seen, the, I've seen it happen. I've been in with my Jeep somewhere, and turn around and come back out, and have one, a deer laying in the road there, and the tracks everywhere, and you come back yeah. in the morning, and you know what's left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and yep. that's really hurt us. But I think the the logging practices as they are today have ruined the landscape. We can't hunt where they go. Yeah, and there's no uh, nobody to police them. They don't police them anymore. There's, well, you mean I, meaning that they're not policing themselves? They're well, they're more about the money and yeah, but somebody should be. Yeah. Well, you you can't do that, man. That, that's their land. And they're going to log it in the most efficient way that they can. We don't own it. But now leaving the tops and, you know, delimiting in the woods. It's most just, of it's such a mess. You cannot walk through it. Some of these companies are, it's like you so say, bad. no no policing or no, um, not a care in the world other than the money that's pulling out of the woods. The rest of it's. Yeah, it's sad. Mm -hmm. It's the, and one thing that hurt us a lot is when there was no money in chipping anymore. The big mills gave up on the chipping. I, I, I would imagine that monetarily it, it wasn't working. Yeah. And so when they couldn't mm. chip all that stuff that used to leave us with the woods, we could go through. Even if it meant going just through it to get over to the elevation you wanted to hunt, that's a discouraging. Yeah. And it's... It'll never be what you've seen, um, yeah. Probably ever. Yeah, yeah. It's same with a lot of that state land that's that's in there. Yeah, it's it's useless now. It, I know it's, it. And you know, it's not. We're talking deer here, but there's a lot of people that we, we all love to go bird hunting, but there are people that are dedicated bird hunters and and with their bird dogs, and they can't go there. Yeah. Yeah. Anymore. They just birds don't mm -hmm. thrive there. The, yeah. the Ask Mike Green. There's no way he's going to take his beagles out there to chase rabbits. Yep. 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 And so it's changed their life a little. He's a fanatic rabbit hunter. Yeah, it's definitely a trickle down effect mm -hmm. there. So I was talking with um, somebody that'll be on this podcast eventually, but uh, he was a forester and he's saying essentially that the federal level is yeah. getting sued and the state level for for areas that they want to cut the state wants to cut or the feds want to cut yeah there's lawsuits against them so that they're held up in court so that they cannot cut it really yep and there's more people that are worried about their views or looking at the trees than yeah what's actually good for the habitat oh yeah. here's a cool story one day i was hunting up on the mountain at home here in vermont <clears throat> and I was following this, tracking this deer, and I got up pretty high, and a little winded, you know, and I sat down on a log, <clears throat> and I was looking down into the valley there, and, and the tracks had gone up behind me, and I got out a sandwich and started to eat the sandwich, and I... I heard this weird noise behind me, and uh, so I really slow turned around, and I don't see anything. After a minute or two, I took another bite of my sandwich. I turned around, sat back down. Then I heard it again. What 
what the hell? So I turned around again, and this time I, I stood up. And there's a bobcat on another log that had fallen the other way, and he was standing on the log. And I just, I don't do anything. My gun's down here. So I want to see him a little better, so I step up. He's looking away from me. I step over here a little ways. Now I can see him really good. And then, I, you know, two, three minutes later, he just, I could see him. He let out that kind of a scream again, you know. And uh, when he did that, this buck comes up out of his bed behind him. And uh, there's some more racks out on the porch. It's one of them. I think it weighed 202, and and it it had almost no teeth left in it. The old game warden when I brought it out. So anyway, I shoot it, and uh, pretty happy. I was young, so I left the deer up there, t-shirt deal. Went back to camp. My dad, they, they wanted to go get it, but it was way up on the mountain. It, you know, you get hurt doing that, so. We got up early in the morning and we all went up. My father, my brother Bobby, and his friend Billy Lucas. And they were uh, teenagers of 17, 18. So we finally get up to it. And uh, I don't mind telling you where it was. If you were down at Lewis Pond looking up on that mountain, it was quite far up on that mountain. So uh, the boys grabbed an antler. Each one of them, and it was steep, and they started to go down. There was quite a lot of snow. And uh, my dad, who never talked a lot, he'd give me a little elbow, and I looked at him, and he said, watch this. Keep your eyes on this. <laughs> well, they went about 30 feet, and then they, they tripped, and they went down. And the buck came in, piled into one or two of them. And Billy Lucas, they let out a big yell, and the, the, the deer's tines and <laughs> I'm sure it left a mark in him because <laughs> he was kind of hurt. So they rolled over and got out from under the buck. You know. We laughed and laughed. And, and my father gave him a lesson in pulling a deer down the hill. And uh, actually, my dad went back to our camp because we had to get a truck to go all the way around and get it. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's the... Buck butt in the behind butt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you had a set of antlers in here um, that I want you to tell the story of. There's a, that ten pointer hanging in the other room, just the just the skull mount that oh. that um, yeah that your mom had yeah got. Yeah. Well, it's kind of uh, yeah one of my favorites because I was a probably a 14-year-old boy, and we were down in Bridgewater uh, hunting in an area called Shadagi. And it was, uh, we had a, my uncle and my dad had a hunting camp there, and one morning they got up and they were putting on this sort of an organized hunt. We didn't have any snow, and my mother liked to hunt, and she hunted on her own quite a bit, and um, or some anyway, and, and so we heard a shot and so my brother who was with me, he was younger, but we finally found them and everybody was trying to find where this deer went and it um uh, we hunted the rest of the day and couldn't find it and the next morning my uncle wanted to do it in a grid thing and so we did that and we never found the deer and it was the end of the season and so we packed up and went home either that day or the next, but my uncle went up in there I think it was the day after, and he found the deer. Uh, it was never weighed, but in, in the deer was ruined, but he, he got the skull and antlers, and it was a really, really nice deer. And the cool thing is she shot it with a single shot, shot 20 gauge shotgun with a slug. No kidding. Yeah. Hmm. That's pretty neat. It's pretty yeah. nice. pretty nice buck. Nice heavy horns. Yeah, sure is. Sure well, I had is. a lot of fun growing up down there one time. My uncle, who I worship so much, there he had a Model A. I have a picture of it out here. And a rumble seat. So my dad shot this buck up on the mountain, and I was about 14. And so we converge on it, and so they're going to go down and get 
the Spud. The Spud was the Model A. So I sit down, and it's getting dark, and I stay there with the deer, and they don't come, and they don't come, and about an hour and a half later, they show up, and they've been in the wobble water, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> so they finally get the deer picked up. It was a like a six-pointer, and into the rumble sea, but hanging out both sides, you know. And that's where I rode, you know, two big men, there's no room for a third kid in that. Mm -hmm. So I get up in the rumble sea on top of the deer, and going down through that old road, it was, it was like a Jeep, that thing. It had chains on the back wheels. And we got down by our camp. It's like, whew, I made it, you know, and they don't stop. So they keep going up the valley to this guy's camp that was a friend of theirs. His name was Bill Safko. He was from Massachusetts, and he was a nice guy. So we get up there, and of course they all come out to see the deer and shake hands and have a beer, you know, and another beer and another <laughs> beer. And finally, Bill Safko said, you want a beer? And he looked at my dad and, ah, I guess he's old enough. So he gave me a beer. Oh, that's cool. So they're talking, shooting their shit. Nobody's had anything to eat. It's eight o'clock now. And so Bill goes by me and went, yeah, I have another one. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I remember being really dizzy <laughs> and kind of wondering, is this wrong? Am I? It's got to be the beer. But I was a little bit scared. And then, so the guy, the, my dad and uncle decided to go back to the camp. So we went outside. And my dad always told the story that I was wobbling. <laughs> and they picked up me up and put me in the back, and they probably did. So I. I s sat and laid on that deer, and the road to our camp was horrible. We got to camp, and I was sick to my stomach. <laughs> then I didn't want my my dad or my uncle to know that, but I got off of the Model A, and I when they were getting the deer out, and they weren't looking, I ran around the back of the camp and threw up. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't as happy about the deer. As no, they were. Oh, yeah, <laughs> didn't yeah. agree with you. Uh, sure. huh. That's funny. That Budweiser brook that you mentioned, yeah, is there more of a story to it than that, or just s somebody leaving a six pack? No, and... I uh, I wanted a, a trail through the woods to go uh, to this other logging road, and it was probably uh, three quarters of a mile. Yeah, but we liked to hunt up in there, and you're always coming back different ways, and it was so in the fall. And, you know, hot, nice October day, and I don't know if she was with me or not, but a backpack and my small chainsaw, and I cut little, I made a path through there the best way I thought, you know. And then by the brook, I had my backpack with a couple of beers in it, or one probably. for the, So I put the beer in there, in the brook, probably one. And when I came back through, you know, I was all sweaty and I Boy, this is nice. I should have some in here for deer season. So I didn't finish the thing that day. So when I went back, I brought two six packs of beer and put them in the brook. <laughs> okay. um, and it it didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I know we one or the other of us would put one in there once in a while. Yeah. But it was, uh, you know. <clears throat> Actually, it was probably only 300 yards from the the truck where we had that. So that's how it got its name. Yep, yep. Huh, that's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, let me just look here. So many stories, he's got to write them down. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> My wife, she was so, so helpful. And one year, I don't know if I had my ankle operation or what it was, but she, you helped me put the tree stand up. The one I shot, the deer, and the warden came. And I, she helped me because I was having a hard time with my, I think it was my ankle. And so I put up a tree stand. And again, I, I like those when I've hunted somewhere and in the last hour of the day, if, sometimes I'd go do those. What? Lots of times other guys used them too, you know. So I go back, I go to that stand, and I got a deer, and uh, 
But in the course of snow on the ground, and later on, I realized that the stand wasn't in the, really the best place. And I figured out why afterwards, so I moved the stand 75 yards and put it up again. And this never happens to me, but I got another deer out of it. So that's rare. So then I started, I never really hunted there a lot. Down over that bank, that little ridge, there was a big string, sh string of beaver dams. It's swampy. Well, I followed tracks down in there, and I found where the deer were getting through. So I moved the tree stand again. And I didn't move it till late in the day that year because we had snow. And so I, I moved it, got it all set up. But unlike, I always put my tree stands in fir trees so you can camouflage. There was no fir trees, so I reluctantly put it up in a maple tree, about that big. And there were some fir trees behind it, but it, it's the only thing that was going to work. But there were deer coming from another way that I didn't know before, because before there was probably bare ground. So, so I move the stand, and I get it all set up, and it's like 2.30. And, you know, I'd gone back and forth 100 yards here or whatever and stunk it all up, so... I go back to my truck and um, drove around to this other area. Uh, no secret there, Black Cat Brook. I went over there and had a place I liked. And so I get out of my truck and Jesus, I, I'd like to be. A, I'd like to be in that. I jump back in and race back over there, and I, it was cold, very cold. And I hiked down in there, and I had a, a wicker backpack and heavy coveralls. And when I, I always fix my blinds up really nice with branches hanging around and stuff. And why I did this, I don't know. But right here, I had cut off a branch about that big and probably stuck out about 14 inches or something. And my, I fell out of a tree stand once. So I started using a, safety harness, and I had two of them. One was in my truck, and one is at the other place I was going to go. Didn't even think of it. I go down there, put my coveralls on, tie my gun to this rope. It's not loaded. I go up, put my gun up. And I did have a little railing thing I'd made. That's all. I leaned the gun there, and I rolled the rope up like this. No, wait a minute. I put the gun over that stick where you can reach it real easy, you know, not. <laughs> then I coil up the rope, put it right over the same stick. <laughs> then I sit back and I'm sure some other people do this, I don't know, but I always found it difficult for me to sit because I, I get so bored. And so I started reading my father's, he had a huge box of old, uh, Zane Gray westerns. So I would bring them and my little half glasses and I would read a little bit, but you know, two or three paragraphs and I'd look around and I could sit there for two hours. Well, I'm sitting there with my, it's cold so my hands are sort of in the coveralls a little bit and with my half glasses on and I look around and look around and it's getting closer to dark. So that's when I would always put my book up. But I think it must have been close to the OK Corral. Or show. Something was really good because I didn't put the book down. But I turned a page and looked up, and there's a buck standing right in front of me from here to the porch steps. I come right across a 100-yard clear cut. <laughs> Never saw it. And it's, when I did this, I think he saw me. You know, switch pages. And it was like eye contact, and he bolts. But this path came down, and he goes, he heads for me to go under my tree. I dropped the book. Oh, I, the rope that I cranked up, I tied it around my waist, tied it around the tree, and then did this. So I went to get up, and I can't, you know, <laughs> shit. So now I turn around, and the buck's gone by my tree, and I'm right-handed, so this isn't working. I pull the, the gun up, and I coil the ropes half on that, and the deer's getting away. <laughs> I get the rope all off, 
and I lean down here and I can't get it in the scope and it's going straight away. Holy shit, my glasses. I pull my glasses off, just throw them. Now I'm leaning out here like this, the stock of my gun's right here. There's no one. Mm. I'm leaning right out like this and I shot and the gun comes back. I almost dropped it. It goes right by me and I catch it like this and then I'm hanging off my seat and I can't get my feet up enough to get up onto this. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> anyway, eventually, without losing my gun and everything, I got back up on there and I sat down and I laughed. <laughs> and I honestly laughed. I know I laughed out loud. And I remember saying, boy, talk about somebody from wherever, <laughs> New Jersey, Boston or something, coming up here. I thought, boy, if anybody ever saw this. <laughs> so anyway... Well, I get down all my stuff, take my coveralls off, put them in my backpack. Said, well, I better just go over there. You never know. Dead. No kidding. I no kidding. swear on her life. Right up the butt. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. So I am total shocked. So I, I want to tell everybody, nobody there, so I, I got it out. So I take my backpack and my coveralls up to my truck, which wasn't far away, a quarter of a mile. And uh, I took all my stuff up and, uh, you know, so I wouldn't be carrying a gun in, in my backpack and stuff. And there's a game warden sitting behind my truck. Actually, I saw his headlights come in through the trees while I was gutting it out. And I, be I became friends with a game warden up there that I liked a lot, but it wasn't him. And he accused me of shooting the deer in the dark after hours, and I didn't. And we had a verbal exchange, and he was going to take my rifle and my gun uh, and my deer. And I, I basically said, what proof have you got that I did anything? I didn't do anything wrong anyway, but what proof? I mean, there's other hunters around. I don't know where you were and heard this shot. But I never heard any shots after dark. And so I'm going after my deer, and my gun's going home with me. So he said, you, you are, you're resisting arrest. And I, I don't know if you want to take this out of this thing or not, <laughs> but I said, you know what? You don't know me. You don't know where I've been or what I've done or who I am. I wouldn't suggest that you try to take my gun. And I'm going to be polite about it. But if you want to go to the hospital... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you make your decision. And he put it like this with his hand. I knew he was after his mace. And I said, stupid decision, friend. You're seconds away from making a horrible decision. I'm going after my deer. And I turned around and walked off, and he drove away. No kidding. Yeah. He was just looking to pester somebody. You know what? That guy and I had other run-ins, and I never had done a thing wrong. I never... Wow. He kept checking me and checking me and checking me, and one day I blew up at him, you know, for the same thing. And one day, like three years later, he, he thought I was with some guys, my friends, who were, you can't, you can't party hunt in Maine, right? You can't drive deer and stuff. That thought that they were doing that, and I was part of that. I came out of the woods where they started and I picked up a friend's truck and drove it around. And That's a friend of mine, Pete, took me up to get my truck and I drove back right when he showed up. Oh. Uh. Anyway, there's more to it. The years later, five years, I went to open the gate up to go into Parmacini on the left side of the lake. It was in the fall. And he drove up, and there was another man with him, turned out to be his brother. And I had swung the, I had drove through, and I was swinging the gate shut. And so I saw him. So I, I said, you going through? He said, yeah, yeah, we are. And so I swung it back open. I said, go ahead, I'll, I'll get it. So he came walking up, and he said, well, back for another year. Huh? He was very friendly. I said, yeah, yeah. I heard you got a good one last year. Yeah, I got lucky. He said, what was it? And we talked about it. So he says, well, I'm, I'm going to go on my way. I said, 
his name. I said, how would you like it if we pretend we never met each other ever before and we started off brand new today? And he looked at me and yeah, he stuck his hand out, we shook hands, and we became good friends. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, after I had a chance to more explain what I told you. Yeah. And he believed me. Yeah. And and in the course of time, I found an illegal moose. Somebody shot, and I led him to it and gave him an idea who I thought it was because mm -hmm. I knew who was hunting in there. And it was. And and then also a, a dead doll. Uh, and uh, I don't know how that came about. And a third time, a guy that shot a doe in front of some friends of ours during deer season. They didn't have any antlers, so they jumped in the truck and took off. But we, we found out who it was, but I did. And so we became good friends, and sometimes you don't know who your friends are mm -hmm. until you give it a chance. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, yep, definitely. Good, yeah. Be good advice. Why do you think there's such really good hunters around this area, like the Northeast Kingdom? Because there is. There's, like, your book, right? There's some really good people, um, experienced woodsmen from this area. Boy, I was going to say maybe it's the big woods that they have, but there's a lot of big woods uh, down, you know, Moscow. Uh, yeah. I'm just throwing them out. And yeah. down where we grew up and the chain of mountains. Is, you know what? You suppose some of it could have been the fact that we would have snow up here when the rest of the state didn't have it. Because mm -hmm. I remember going in to camp and there'd be no snow on Island Pond and you get up uh, like the second road, you know, going up towards Lewis Pond and we'd always see it and then we'd get up to camp and we'd have two, three inches and you could be up hunting and look off and it was bare. Yeah. Maybe the, both of those reasons a little bit. Yeah. But, but is it? There's way less deer for sure in this country, but. It, it can be awfully frustrating. Yeah. I see it today with friends that come to my camp. And I think a lot of it came from um, being the type of country that we have up here. And if they wanted to eat and survive, they had to learn how to hunt in these woods. I don't think it would help the ones in the big woods, though. Well, it's a good point you make, but yes, you knew how you grew up, and that was uh, uh, that's exactly how I grew up. Yeah, I know. I will say that I I, I do agree with you uh, on in that sense of things, Nancy, because if you look back to the the folks who lived in the big woods um, that solely hunted for the purpose of filling their freezers mm -hmm. they were trackers right like that is the most successful method mm -hmm. in the big woods right there's a deer in front of you you got to catch up to that deer and shoot him yeah you know so maybe that woodsmanship skill is a little bit stronger in that sense within this what do you think on that your father was a, an outstanding hunter your family was so i I sort of believe that's exactly what you guys are talking about. Um, the lower amount of deer that we have up here, um, it forces you to become a better hunter. Uh, that's a good point. You know, I think I think that's what I saw as and as I got to travel to other parts of the country. You know, um, when we ended up out in Ontario, there was bucks everywhere you know yeah and you didn't i mean you didn't have to hunt as hard as we did here in vermont northern yeah. vermont yeah um and and it was like that in other places kansas and you know it's that's what i believe but i but i i don't know for sure it definitely has something to do with work ethic right like some of these guys <laughs> yeah. you know we were talking about a mutual friend earlier who used to work for you and how uh -huh. good of a worker he was oh, right yeah yeah and yeah. he is yeah and he He's very successful deer hunting because of that work ethic, right? Yeah, um, well, that, I just totally agree with you because it's such a hard job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was that was the only way 
I mean, that was, deer was part of, they were part of our diet. It was a staple and all year long Mm -hmm. because we were not very affluent at all. Um, Hey, my dad's dead. You going to arrest him now? (laughs) (laughs) no no, it's it's true i don't think if you would somehow none of my family was very successful at all over it so what's the difference there three brothers my brother bobby were wicked work ethics so much so that it was more important than hunting. Did he ever get the chance to hunt, really? Yeah. He, he, he was a good hunter, and he was a good shot. And he shot a, a few deer. But his priority was he never spent a week hardly. You know, he'd go to Maine with us in later, later years, and he often came home a little early. Yeah. Because um, it was work. He, he had... Six carpenters working for him, and he'd get nervous, you know. And, but I think what you said probably you're, were you're right, you know. I hadn't thought of it that way. Before you met, how did you hunt? How did I hunt? Yeah. I grew up around guys like Terry Spear. Uh-oh. Right? Yes. Eric Adams, um, you know, the Carl Bakers. You know, I knew of the David Tolmans and oh, reading yeah. your book and, yeah. you know, hearing Will Stats and yeah. many more, right? Um, the Benoits, right? They live just down the road. I mean, yeah. 15 minutes down the road yeah. from me. You know, I used to shoot shotguns with, with Lanny, and it was the most oh. impressive thing you'd ever seen before. I mean, I grew up in that environment, right? And I didn't mm-hmm. really turn into a deer hunter until I was you know, 17, 18 years old. We always did it as a weekend warrior type sure, of thing. Sure, sure. But I had a <clears throat> mutual friend whose father spent time in the big woods, and I saw the box that he was bringing home, and he gave me a chance with him to go to these places, right? Oh. And his influence and his him taking the time to take me is instantly what got me yeah. there, right? And once I succeeded once, I just came back for more and more and more, yeah. right? Like anybody would do, like we all do. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, and even those failed experiences, um, I guess those light the fire even more, right? The ones that you miss, the, the, the big bucks mm-hmm. that you don't get, you know, or the ones that you never catch up to. Yeah. You know, it's always failed on the Failed experiences, of mm-hmm. you know? My uh, Uncle Gordon, we had this in Bridgewater. We had this hill in, in the mountains there, with this hill. And there was, it was called Cobble. There was a settlement in there in the old days, and the fever or something wiped them, yellow fever or something. Yeah. There was an old schoolhouse called the Seal Bed. The chalkboards were in there all falling down near our camp. And there was a, a community of farmers. There was patches of apple trees all over and chimneys in the woods now. But uh, we always seemed to get a deer or two off Cobble. There was an escape escape route on the back side of it. So if the guys would come here and push up to the top, that they would take somebody who didn't have a deer and, okay, your turn to go mm-hmm. to the sit. So I'm like 14 or 15, and Uncle Gordon said, well, why, do, Del, you know how to get to where we're going to end up. That's your day. And my father said, you know, and rightfully so, no, no. He'll have his day when he gets older. And my uncle, who ran things at the camp, said, no, it's he's going. So can you find it? Yeah, you know where we nestle in to sit there by the little firs, yeah. Because they got deer there, so we'd all end up there at times. Mm-hmm. So I'd already been there. They didn't always get a deer, but I'd already been there six, seven times. So they gave me three quarters of an hour to get around, and I got into that little place. But I didn't think I could see good. So I got up, <laughs> I moved forward a little bit. I'd say 
10 yards, and I got up on a stump. It was about that big, and I could barely get up on it. It was probably that high. I got up on it, and he decided to stand there, right in the open. And so after a little while, all of a sudden, I see this doe coming down, and my eyes were glued to it. She came down from me to your knee, yeah. and I was scared, like like this, you know, I don't know if I was shaking or what, and she turned her head over her back, was looking back up there. I looked up there, and here comes a buck. Holy shit. So what do I do? Well, she, I think that he might have smelled me or something, and she, and she hadn't. And then all of a sudden, just like this, she bolted. But she turned and went this way here, and the deer didn't, the buck stood there. So I had my mother's 30, 32, 40 Winchester, Love ration, and I, I can't get planted very good. I get turned around, take careful aim, and I shoot, and nothing happens. So the deer doesn't move. So I work the action, and I jam the next shell in, and the deer doesn't run. So I get the gun freed up, you know, and get it back together, and I shoot again. The deer doesn't move. I do the same thing again. The deer still hasn't run. The, the doe has stopped over <laughs> here. And so the third time, he bolted. And he ran down by me. Of course, I didn't get a gun. And by the way, I, I pretty much fell off that time <laughs> off the stump. And uh, the other times, are one of this, you know. <laughs> and, and so not, not long after, everybody converged on me, you know, my, my father and my uncles my cousin, and they get down there. And Uncle Gordon got to me first, and he says, what What happened, you know? So I tell him, he said, okay, where were you? you you're sitting by the first, and I, I can't lie to him. Mm -hmm. So I tell him, no, said, okay, he didn't give me shit. He said, okay, tell, tell me where it went. We got any, don't have any snow, so. He goes over, and I'm sure he found where it was running, and he's, and my father comes along. So then, after a while, my cousin's there and stuff. And finally, Gordon can't find any blood. Then he finally comes up, and my father asked me what happened. And so I told him. And then he said, "Well, you, you know, did you, did you think about putting your, your arm, your bracing your arms? Because he knew I was small. And I said, oh. I was standing on that stump. And he said, What? <laughs> He started to give me a little grief, you know. Nothing bad, bad, but like, but I remember to this day him saying, well, I, my uncle's coming up. He said, well, I guess that's an example of sending a boy to do a man's job. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle said, Bill Green, loud, that was his younger brother, not as big as my dad. He said, shut up. And my dad said, well, you know, he said, I said, shut up. You know? <laughs> and my father goes, well, you know, okay, okay, I'll tell you what. Dell, you want to know what your father did once? My father said, what the heck are you talking about? You know, what, what are you going to tell him now? Remember at the barn when we were kids? He don't need to hear that. You know? <laughs> so Uncle Gordon told me about, he said, we had Ma's old 3220, I think he said it. He said there was a big buck out behind the barn, and we snuck around, and we got our gun, and, and, uh, and you're, your father had, I don't remember, like seven shells, and he shot at this buck standing still seven times, and he missed it every time. <laughs> and he, he says, right, Bill, my dad kind of smiles, says, well, I may be, you know. He says, and then what? Uh, he don't need to hear that. And he said, we had one more shot, and he said, I grabbed the gun and put it in there, and I shot the buck. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to embarrass somebody there, we're even. <laughs> so my father laughed, uh, patted me on the, the back. back. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. It's pretty easy to do. A lot of area around them. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Yeah. I notice as we tell stories here, we don't always get the deer, you know. Mm. It's just part of why we do yeah. it. That's why we do it. Yeah. Brings you back. Keeps you coming mm -hmm. back for more. Jesus, I guess. You know. And it's something about the north woods or the big woods right like as we sit where we are you've got deer all around you and the first thing you 
told me when we walked through the door was there's deer all over. I've never heard deer hunted here in my life. No, I never have. It just, no. there's more meaning to where you're hunting in the, the actual hunt, right? Well, how about how disappointed you are when you're hunting and you, you bump into a deer hunter? Yeah. Just one? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. True story. Yeah. So, well, should we wrap this thing up? It's been a pleasure. It's been yeah. fun. Yeah, it has. It definitely has, so. Great to uh, have both of you. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Yeah. yeah. Nancy, thank you for getting on. All right, guys. Till the next one.